Welcome, Mari. I think we're going to have a great conversation. I understand you had dinner last night with Sue, and she said that I was the best interviewer she's absolutely. ever worked with. Is that what she told you? It's mic drop. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so we're going to have the same yeah. fun here. So Mari Cross, she serves as the SVP of Global Success and Services at Confluent, which is a fast-growing cloud company. They went public in 2021, mm -hmm. right? Um, and just as importantly, previously she served as the head of enterprise customer success at Adobe. And so we thought it would be really interesting to do sort of a compare and contrast of what it is like to lead customer success at a, at a large established company versus a, you know, a fast growing SaaS startup. And, and you know, what, what's the same, what's different. And so that's the ground we're gonna cover. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna start with the big large company environment. So establishing CS in a software company that has been around you know, for, for a long time, not born in the cloud, so this is you know, new stuff for them. And there's several challenges in that you know, scenario, starting with, okay, we're gonna build this new CS capability, what's its charter, how does CS compare to support, you know, all those types of things. So I wanna start with, when you're standing CS up in a legacy company, and there are companies in this room that may still have yet to do that, how do you carve out territory for the role of that new CS organization? Yeah, absolutely. So when I joined Adobe, um, it was gosh, seven years ago, let's say, um, we were acquired in by, um, I was at a company before that called LifeFire, and uh, we got acquired in, and I took on this new role, and what was interesting to find out was that because Adobe had really created its marketing stack through acquisition, um, there were CS organizations kind of sprinkled throughout, However, they all had very different backgrounds, right? So some of them acted maybe more like, you know, the technical support kind of function, some yeah. of them more strategic. And so one of the first things that I realized I really needed to do was carve out, uh, very intentionally carve out what the purpose and the mission and the vision of that organization was going to be for the enterprise customer base. And of course, that had to be rooted in what Adobe needed to accomplish with its customers and what customers needed from us. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time making sure that we had that straight before we did anything else. Um, and then we really went through the process of building out you know, the, the multiple year vision of what a transformation would look like for that team to get to where we needed to go. And understanding also that with these different organizations, um, there were people there and they all had different skills and they all had different competencies. And so it, you know, laying out the, the, the vision was one thing, but then also mapping out people and how we could either up-level their skills and enable them or figure out who we needed to bring in from the outside was really a big piece of that puzzle as well. I'd say the next most important part was making sure we had buy-in from the ecosystem, I would say, on what customer success was going to do. And you know, when you're carving out space, you certainly need to have that leadership buy-in, but you also need to have this... Um, buy-in at the ground level, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're going to go talk to sales, they need to know what you stand for and, and so yeah. on and so forth. So we did a lot of that type of, of, of kind of shopping the vision around, got some good buy-in at the highest level. Um, and then, you know, bottom line is people have a lot of predisposed notions about what CS does regardless. And so it really takes a lot of time, and I would say called landing the change, communications, and lots of, lots of effort around that to make sure that we started not only executing the program, but then actually delivering results and then really communicating on a regular basis. I'll give you an example. I mean, like the newsletter is not the most exciting thing in the world, but we literally started publishing a weekly newsletter where not only do we talk about what our metrics were every single time, but then also um, we had case studies and where it really highlighted what the CS organization did and how it was different from everyone else. And the big point of that wasn't because we wanted to do a newsletter, it was really a big branding exercise and how do we get as many people to understand um, through examples and through stories what the CS team was going to do. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it came down to results, of course. Okay. So. so I want to play back yeah. as I listen to you and put some timing around this so that people can frame this in because the scenario being, okay, there's some several acquisitions, so I have, really have sort of multiple CS organizations in play, which aren't all the same animal. Mm -hmm. Some more technical, maybe some, who knows, some could have been renewal, and that's all they, who knows. And so you have this portfolio of CS capabilities that, that needs to be rationalized. You have to, A, bring that together, and in this new entity, you have to basically align with the rest of the company around what is going to be the model, right? 
So, and then build the roadmap on the skills and the capabilities. Just give some timing of that journey from, okay, we have to rationalize this till we come out the other side and we have a cohesive CS mm -hmm. you know, organization and capability. You know, that was what, two, three weeks? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was easy. It was over the weekend. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I think the developing the vision was, you know, I'd say a couple of months, you know, the, doing the research. That wasn't really the hard part. But I think, you know, when we, the first vision we came up with was really all around how, you know, our CS teams were going to be driving value realization for our customers. Um, and that was a two year vision that we put forth, okay, right? Yeah. And so. I was, um, I was thinking at least, seriously, yeah, it was, at least yeah, two years. Yeah, let's be clear, we were still landing it a couple of years after that. But yeah. that was the vision of the, the first two year vision that said, hey, we have a roadmap and we had things we'd be delivering along that roadmap. Yeah. Um, there's nothing worse than saying you're going to do something and not being ready to deliver it. So we were, again, very intentional also to say, hey, by this point, we will be taking on this body of work. That's not the full picture, but it's this body of work. And then we're going to move on to the next piece and then the next piece. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just wanted to get that on, on, yeah. on the table because I think you know these types of organizational changes, establishing new capabilities, getting people aligned around them, they are you know, typically multi-year journeys. And so yeah. people you know, have to get their heads around that. Um, so in establishing the interfaces for this new CS capability, you, obviously you have to play nice with sales, with the product teams, you know, working with the customers. Which was the most challenging to really kind of get right and why? Yeah, you know, they all had their unique challenges. I think fundamentally customers love us, so that, 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 was, that, probably was, the easy the, that was the easy part, as yeah. long as we could get in front of them. And, but yeah. I think so when you think about sales, um, there, I think two main challenges with sales. One was that it was, it's new for them. They all, again, also came in with all of their own you know, preconceived notions about what CSMs did and what CS did. Um, so we had to very much so convince them of what our model was. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, they're also very protective of their customers. It's their relationship at the time. And yeah. they say, hey, what are you going to do? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. how are you going to show up in front of my customer? So there's a little bit of, you know, there's certainly a slow building of trust there. Right. Um, and then the, the last piece of it, I think, with them was that they're also, at least at, at Adobe, they were very used to having an ecosystem around them to serve them, right? So like SDRs used to get them leads and other mm -hmm. people used to deliver you know, support in some way. And so the idea that we really wanted to set up um, CS as a third leg of the stool versus a supporting element for sales was something we had to work very hard at um, yeah. and it took quite a bit. Um, the way we did that with them is like we, we decided to focus on, I mean, this is a very tactical item, but we decided to take on this idea of a QBR where forever, you know, sales teams were doing them on their own mm -hmm. and maybe not even that well. And we said, you know, we're just going to take that off your plate and that's, that's going to be our commitment to you. And that was just the first entryway we got in front of the customers in yeah. a very meaningful way. And then they're like, you're here forever. We don't ever so want to see you go. So this is good because I really, I want to click in this because my observation is it is that tension between CS and sales. That is the toughest, right? Because mm -hmm. and it is this issue of ownership. Who owns the customer? And you know, my point of view, TSI point of view, that, that you know, the company owns the customer. Yes. The process owns the customer. Yes. The sales. There's no one person that owns a customer. I know that you know, for sales organizations, they don't. That, that's not a you know, popular opinion. But the tactic that you had to to say, well, let's start looking at ways that we can add value to sales with the customer. So we're going to you know, pick off the QBR, and we're going to start there and run that play. And again, CS, yes, it's a process. So you're it's good at the process. And, and, and then the sales goes, oh, I see value there. And, you know, so it was you know, any other clicks that you took there to, that you found were winning things that you could pick off to build the trust? Absolutely. I mean, I think fundamentally, CSM is, we also were very clear about our metrics, and our metrics aligned with sales as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we had, we had renewals metrics and things that they really cared about as well. And so we very much so tried to take every opportunity to figure out how to align our success to their success. Um, and that was very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. We also tried, did a lot of work with, from a planning perspective, to create um, minimal disruption to teaming, meaning you know, we tried to create pods of sales teams and CSM so they could develop deep relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, oftentimes I've seen when there's not enough care taken on that coordination, you can have one CSM or one, one salesperson have 15 CSMs. It's near impossible to run a business that way, yeah. at, at least at that enterprise scale. Yeah. Um, and so we did quite a bit of that you know, work around making sure that those relationships were established as well. We, did, we really did a lot of events and things like that together as well to build personal relationships as well as just the professional ones. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all awesome tactics because I think again, that is the toughest one mm -hmm. to, get, to, to build the trust and get it get it right. So, um, so I, let's talk systems mm -hmm. um, because it's one of the hardest 
you know, rocks to move and you're going from license-based traditional yeah. software model and now you're going to this thing where you have to, you, know, you need telemetry and you're driving adoption, et cetera. Um, you know, what, what did you focus on first when it came to systems? Yeah, so for us, it was incredibly important. It's actually, I've, I've seen this at Confluent as well. It's the, the foundational data model, I mean, I can't, it's not a system, but it's, I cannot stress enough how the foundational data model is the most important thing an organization can get, can do to get right. It's like the idea of building a system on a, you know, an, uh, on a quicksand foundation or something like that. Like it just doesn't work mm-hmm. unless that data model is right. And what I mean by data model, it's uh, things like, how do you define a customer, right? Is a customer an opportunity? Is a customer a brand that rolls up to a big brand, right? Mm-hmm. Which one are you going to track? And yeah. all of that needs to be very aligned throughout the organization because I think Nirvana is a customer 360, but you really have to understand what customers are. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to clean up your renewals data. Again, I'm sure I'm saying the obvious here because every, every company I've ever talked to at least has <laughs> issues around this, but yeah. that, you know, putting in the work, and sometimes it's a multi-year effort to do that depending on how much tech debt you have. Um, it's really important to get that right because when you can get that foundational data element right um, and the data is of high quality and it's aligned throughout the organizations, then the systems you bring on can scale really quickly and are very powerful. Otherwise, you're spending tons of manual effort before you know things get even ingested into systems and or the systems are, um, like I said, built on incorrect data, which just you know, it ruins their um, no. dependability or, or availability. Yeah. Um, and I'd say after that, it's a customer 360 for sure. Yeah. It's the idea of how do you have all parts of the organization um, looking at a single pane of glass? Um, and how is that single pane of glass flexible enough that if we buy another company or do another acquisition, you can pull in their information as well and have it be a functional yeah. Um, interface? Yeah. So I want to jump to the other scenario. Mm-hmm. which is scaling CS in a born in the cloud company. Mm-hmm. And so well, let's start with, so, so you do this in the established, you know, all the, all the challenges there, the, the friction points. Now you go to born in the cloud, hey, you know, CS in a sense is, is native. What was easier in that scenario? Um, well, I think being born in the cloud, just fundamentally you have access to data if you want it. Now you have to turn it on, there's a little bit of work to do, but the yeah. promise of Nirvana is there, Yeah. right? I mean, you can get to it. Yeah. Um, and so what it unlocks is the ability to really also start being innovative and creative, um, not only in your systems, but in, in your go-to-market models, right? So like the idea of a consumption model is really born by being able to get to this, all this great data. And so yeah. when you can look at consumption, you can create an entire motion around how you sell it differently, how you um, drive adoption differently, how you can create an entire methodology and you, know, you can observe how people are using your solutions and really see what's happening um, in, in real time and really de- design a lot of deep methodology around it. And so that becomes a great aspect of, you know, you don't have to retrofit going back right, into systems right. and trying to figure out maybe how it all fits together, but you can yeah. actually observe it in real time um, and see it work, which is really, really interesting. I think that's been a very um, interesting experience for me at Confluent in that you know we've done a lot of moves like you know, to, to become a consumption-driven model, um, you know, we've, we've taken away our paywall. So customers don't have to pay to try our products anymore. Mm-hmm. And you know, we literally onboard them before they ever, ever have to pay for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that is possible because of the cloud and elasticity yeah. and being able to, to get to those types of approaches. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember, I think this was in consumption economics. We had a sentence in there talking about the data piling up on the floor for some of these SaaS companies. And what we, we were talking about, because you, you put this on the table, you said the data is there, but you, but you got to turn, turn it on, on and yeah. leverage it. So you know, I, I would say that historically, some of these early day SaaS companies, it's like they did not realize yeah. what potential they had, right? And so, but now you turn around and you go, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I have the 360 view. Um, now I think everybody understands the power of that. And then, and then you know, moving forward, that's why we believe getting customers in to that as a service type of posture, whether it's still on-prem and connected or truly cloud, it, you know, has to be the end winning game because the disadvantage of you're flying blind and you don't have that data yeah. versus having it. I mean, you know, it's, it's absolutely night and day for not just CS, but for the whole for company. For the entire company, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's a big deal. So that's a beautiful thing about, you know, being starting there, but uh, I'm sure it was no cakewalk. So what are, <laughs> so what are some of the, the most challenging things when you're trying to scale? Because this is where I see people 
you know, they're like, yeah. hey, I'm in a SaaS company and I got to see it. But oh, how do you fund this thing as we're getting yeah. bigger and it's getting harder and my budgets and all that kind of stuff. So, so what are the biggest challenges there? To, to scale a small company. Um, yeah. yeah, so gosh, so it's so fun being at a fast growing company, right? Like there's so much excitement, there's so much hiring. That all sounds amazing, right? Great culture. Um, but onboarding hundreds and hundreds of people at the same time, for mm -hmm. instance, and staying aligned as an organization yeah. is no cakewalk at all, right? Yeah. So um, there has to be such a focus on being really, I would almost say, as simple as possible so that you can maintain alignment across the, the organization, right? So making sure that what everybody does is built into each other's onboarding, um, that you keep that up to date because we're all changing and you know evolving so quickly. So that is something that is... It is a bigger challenge than one would think. Um, the other part is, even though we have the opportunity to, to to do a lot of things the right way and scale, when you're growing really quickly, sometimes you still re, you know go back to, hey, it's easier maybe to run this in a spreadsheet right now because yeah, right, you right. know we don't have enough time or right. something like that. And that's that's a very dangerous thing to get into because you could end up finding yourself you know, at a point where you really can't scale the spreadsheet, but you're growing so fast and right. can sneak up on you pretty quickly. So, you, so your growth gets ahead of your, your capabilities, your infrastructure, because, yeah. 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 I get that. And it's hard, right? I mean, the prioritization is one of the hardest things there because also, like, you know, people, people in fast growth companies right now, I mean, CS has been around for a while. A lot of folks know what needs to be done, and so there's also this exuberance about doing it all at the same time. Right. And um, so I think there's a lot of rigor that has to go into really understanding what needs to happen now, how does that build on a foundation, what are we not going to do is right. a really, really important question to answer. So two things I want to click in there. The, the first is, I, mean, I had an experience early in my, my career at Silicon Graphics where we went from 2,000 to 10,000 employees in four years. And one of the biggest challenges I observed, and I think this is what you're on with the spreadsheets, is tribal knowledge. Mm -hmm. some, at some point you have to flip because when you're smaller, tribal knowledge is fine. Hey, we know how to get stuff done. Oh yeah, you need to get that done? Call Jim over there, and he just he can make that happen. But then at some point, there's an inflection where that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. There's too many people. And so, um, so how do you basically get people to understand that what has been working very well in tribal knowledge will not get us moving forward? Like, how do you get people motivated to make the, the flip? So, I mean, I, I think people are motivated, as far as I can tell, to, to do it. It's literally helping them find the time and really, I think for us it was investing in, we do actually have a knowledge management system and it's slowly going through the idea of, you know, can you ring fence a quarter where you have professional services really look at mm -hmm. creating reusable assets, right? Or yep. just providing a real focus on that as leaders to make sure that it happens and that you have a space for it, right? Because it really does have to scale and grow. Yeah. Um, but it's, I will say, it's, it's not easy. The thing that keeps us going quite a bit, and what I always fall back to, is certainly a Confluent, it's a, such a customer-centric organization. One of the values is customer love, for instance. Yeah. And you know, the way we always try to think about it is, how are you going to show up to the customer? If you just put yourself in the customer's shoes, if you have mm -hmm. seven different teams coming to the customer and they say seven different things, or even if it's the same team, but different, let's say, you know, different CSMs or different professional services individuals coming to a customer and approaching things in a different way, mm -hmm. what a horrible experience that is, right? And right. so we usually try to bring it back to what is going to be the customer experience, and that kind of snaps people back a little bit to being like, okay, I know this is important and we're, we're going to do it. Well, and, and just to build, I mean, and again, a good customer experience being something that is consistent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's going to deliver a quality exchange with that customer, and you get that you know, typically not with tribal knowledge, yes. but with a more you know, standard methodology and approach. So getting people to value, yeah. Totally. Yeah, I, I and and quite key. frankly, I, we have brilliant people in our organization. I want them focused on mm -hmm. the most value-add things, right? And they, do. So do they, right? Yeah. So we'd say, hey, publish white papers and blogs and mm -hmm. create the new, you know, the new innovative thing that you're working on versus, you know, yeah. repeatedly figure out a problem yeah. that's Again. been solved before Again. over and over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. The other thing I want to click in there when you're talking about fast growth is in this current um, labor environment, you're saying, oh, you know, you got to hire hundreds of people and specifically in CS, which has become a hyper competitive skill yeah. set. All you lucky CS people out there, <laughs> the calls coming in all the time. So how, how are you you know, managing through that. What are, what are some of your success tactics there to say, hey, we can A, get the talent and then keep the talent? 
Yeah. I think culture goes a long way for, for organizations and certainly yeah. for us. Um, you know, we have a lot of very passionate people um, and the, the culture at, at our company currently is very much so, uh, um, you know, one for all, all for one, um, very customer centric, like I said, and just a very kind, hardworking, excited about the future culture. So keeping an eye on what we're building has been really important. I think, you know, um, we are creating a new, I'd say, approach to, um, you know, we're creating data streaming platforms, right? That is something very new in the industry. Mm -hmm. And what it unlocks for our customers and the potential of it is so huge. Um, the, between that as well as the, the ability to um, be with a group of very kind people who are all focused on this one big mission and being very mission driven is, is I think one of the biggest things that helps us keep people. So yeah, so I definitely want to click into that one because I, what I am hearing and I'm seeing, especially with this, um, you know, this younger generation, right, that are coming in, that, you know, two things matter. One is culture, but I believe culture has always mattered for yeah. all of us, right? Um, but mission, I keep mm -hmm. hearing this more and more. Well, so what's our mission? Like, what, 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 you know, what are we doing? And it, I don't care, you know, what you, you know, you guys are selling out there. Everybody can have a meaningful yep. mission, right? Yeah. But what, what I'm hearing is, I, you know, I was interviewing somebody who works in the healthcare industry, um, uh, Candace from Relias, and she was, again, they're on a mission to help their, you know, customers in, in, in healthcare. Other people are on a mission that work with nonprofits like Black Bottom, and, and that's an easy sell in a sense, right? People go, yeah. I want to be part of that mission. And, and from top down, people feel they're part of something really meaningful. But like yesterday, you know, I was talking about, you know, if, if Michelin, right, with the tower example, if they say, look, I'm on a, on a mission to help the planet use less yeah. gas, that's compelling, right? And so I think that's something we have to, as leaders, be thinking more and more about. What's our story mm -hmm. <laughs> to our employees about the mission that we're on? Because I think if, that, if there's a big sucking sound there, right, and then it just comes down to pay, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think th this generation is going to gravitate to the mission. 100%. And it was, it was interesting. I mean, we did this at Adobe, and I, I see it the same thing at Confluent, which is the idea of activating our customer stories is just so important, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, an, an event streaming platform, is that interesting? Or a marketing stack, is that really that interesting? It's the what the customers do with it that is so compelling. Yeah. The fact that we were able to, you know, power um, effective, um, you know, immediate results for vac vaccines, um, vaccine results, or I'm sorry, for COVID testing results like during yep. the COVID pandemic, right? Something like that is a really important story to get out also to your teams to understand not just the, the check the box, how do you do your work every day, but how do you actually driving outcomes for, for customers? There's a really meaningful psychological component to that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, think, I think it's an important point. Okay, so this is a question that I like to ask every executive <laughs> at a fast-growing startup, okay? When does a fast-growing startup actually care about making money? <laughs> when does that happen? When we go public? Just kidding. When um, does that happen? <laughs> um, look, I, I think, Every company, especially in this environment right now, yeah. I think everybody cares about making money. Yeah. Um, it's gotten even you know, more important as, it, as we sit here. Um, but I think at some point, even, um, even with companies with, with really large coffers, at some point that line item that is an investment line item, just, it becomes too big to, yeah. to ignore. And it's, yeah. it's very hard to maintain that. And so I think there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is ensuring you have really specific um, focus for these roles that potentially could be investment roles, right? Um, mm -hmm. Making sure that they're not doing the work of others. Okay. That's one. Yeah. I think we do need to support um, those roles with, let's say, digital and again, taking away things that are not value add. But ultimately, I do think also, you know, I think the world is kind of, you know, we were talking yesterday when you were talking with Sue, there's a lot of, hey, is, is, uh, is there a pattern repeating itself type of conversation? Mm -hmm. And I think there is an element of the fact that um, customer success driving adoption, which then, let's say, fuels consumption, is a little bit like an account management motion almost. Yeah. That you know, when you start thinking about the kind of the role and its essence, and so being connected to some sort of financial outcome, it gets, it makes sense, yeah. and it, it becomes pretty important. I think and can alleviate some of some of um, what you know we're facing here. Yeah. Um, I think even though for fast-growing companies, you know, what some of the things we constantly talk about is, you know, what are the margins that we really need versus want versus do we pay for ourselves? Do we actually make money? Yeah. I'm still, I think I'm still stuck on that. We just need to pay for ourselves versus mm -hmm. necessarily drive a huge, 
yep. margin for the company. But I do think there's, we do need to be able to justify that. Yeah. And, and by paying investment. for yourself, so this is having some level of monetization. Some level, of, some level <laughs> of monetization in the mix where you can you can cover off for the expenses. Yeah, the, the team yeah. drives. I mean, and on that one, in terms of in general, the company making money, monetizing some of the CS offers helps yeah. you know, get across that that break point. And uh, you know, our observation it, it is very hard to scale. CS if there's zero monetization going on because you just become at some point yeah. so you know expensive but you know our data shows I mean the percentage of companies that actually monetize CS has always stayed below that 50% mm -hmm. threshold so it's not a quote common practice and I'm very curious if in the next year or two if in this current economic yeah. environment if that doesn't flip and become you know 55% 60% yeah. whatever because I, I don't see how you get there, <laughs> you know, in, in, a, in a SaaS company without some level of, you know, premium type offers that the, that the customer is willing to pay for. But, um, well, but I think it's two ways, right? It's either selling this, this CSM, some, some part of the CSM function as an offer to the customer or having the CSMs more closely aligned to driving an outcome for, yes. for the business yeah. Um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, I mean, our saying at TSIA is that you know customer success is a service motion with a sales result. Yeah, that's really what it is. I mean, that's what you're talking about—the outcome, the financial, the financial impact. Um, okay, so so let's talk pattern recognition between the startup and the large company. What do you think any CS organization, no matter the profile here in the audience, um, what are some of the critical success factors? Do you think that now that you've been in both sides of that? Yeah, um, I you know what, some of the stuff we've, we've talked about, but some of it might be new. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I think getting really good clarity on what you do as a CS organization and being super vigilant around not... Oh, that charter. You know, yeah, that charter, right? And yeah. your metrics and what do you really stand mm -hmm. for? I think it's just that that is can be problematic. You will, like, over the years, will constantly get pressure on it. New leaders will come in. New salespeople will come in. New product people will come in. That pressure to stretch a little bit or do something a little bit differently will always change. And so just the intentionality around that is really, really important. Um, and then to support, certainly to support the teams with whatever skills they need to get there. Um, I think this idea of, of landing change within the organizations is, is that has been the, the same in, in both places, right? It's, you, there's a lot of great thinking that happens across the board in all these, in all these teams, like mm -hmm. tons of great thinking. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, areas that I see really crush companies, it's not the, the lack, of, um, lack of ideas or lack of innovation, it's how they land change throughout the organizations, and not just in their teams, but really thinking broadly across the entire company. Yeah. Um, making sure, like I said, that, that sales knows what you as a CSM is doing, or that product does, or that engineering does, and if you evolve, that you take people along for the ride, yeah. and that you show up to, you know, to the customers in that, in that single way. Um, I think the idea that products exist for context, right, so like, you know, feature function is not enough, it's always going to be around what, what are you enabling, and yeah. so when we think about driving adoption for doesn't matter what solution I've ever had. It's really about how do you teach people to use the, the tooling or the solutions, but it's in context of also how they can um, enable their teams, drive change management on their side if there is, mm -hmm. you know, if that needs to happen. Yep. That always has to be a component that if you don't get that right, then it doesn't really matter how good your product is. It, right. it really fails. And so right. a lot of focus around that yeah. um, I've seen. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, CS being the, the first capability of a company to really have to master what you just described, which is what is, you know, why is the customer not adopting? And we have to really understand that. And, and you know, on that point, we, you know, the difference between traditional support or what PS does or anybody else, you know, people say, oh, you know, we, we have a CS organization, we just rebranded our support organization. Well, you don't, yeah. you know, they're probably not really leaning into that yeah. problem. And, and it's a new problem and it's a hard one to solve. I mean, you got to really put time and treasure. Yeah to understand that. Totally, and I, well, the other thing about, in terms of pattern recognition, for me, what I'm also seeing, and I love this part, which is like, you know, we went, 
you know, we went through an entire transformation with sales where you know, this idea of sales stages got developed, right? And like there's the marketing funnel and I'm, I'm really excited about the idea that you know, CS is going to be and continues to be going down that same path where yeah. we really can create a much more rigorous approach to measuring journey steps along the way mm -hmm. with time bound you know, yep, expectations absolutely. and, and things like that because I yeah. think a lot more is going to happen in, in, that, yeah. um, in that element. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I actually want to go back to your, your comment on charters. It's interesting, Stephen Fulkerson, who leads our CS research here, and before him, Phil Nanis, who I saw at the conference here. I mean, they're, they have always you know, pounded on the table. What's the charter? Like the what's first the place when you're working with the CS organization, you want to be successful. What's the charter? What's the charter? Like, you're confused on that. Yeah. Then the rest of the company is confused on that and you're you're probably not going to be very successful yeah. trying to and it's different for different companies i mean oh, i think that's, that's the thing it's 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 yeah. like you know it's, it's not by no means a one size fits all model yeah there's not a one size fits all and there, there's a spectrum there um and, and it's fine right the, the different charters it's it's not there is not the one answer on charter there's mm -hmm. not um but what is really critical is the clarity on charter yeah for sure so um so let me ask what would you advice would you give to a peer that goes from you know managing CS in a legacy company, you know company that's been around for a while, you know like, and then you go into a startup environment. Like, what you know, what should they be aware of, paying attention to, yeah. to, to to help them be successful? You know, certainly. I mean, I think um, I'm I'm a very people first leader, so I you know my my uh, recommendation is always to just go in and listen and get to know certainly get to know the people um, understand the culture there right mm -hmm. and what makes it tick and what makes it unique okay. um, I would say quickly thereafter you know you'll get lots of presentations from thing, all the things that are being done and the roadmaps and things like that I mean I would certainly advise looking under the hood um, seeing what of those processes is still being run on spreadsheets <laughs> right, okay, right? Yeah. I mean it's just like it's the truth right so um, it's it, don't do the cursory review of like, oh yeah, we do renewals outlooking and we do, you know, forecasting for professional services and whatever. It's like really looking underneath the hood and being like, okay, how is this being done? Is it, and is it scalable? Mm -hmm. um, I think is a really important um, piece of the puzzle there. Yeah. And then, and then again, just making sure that you get a really good sense for um, certainly what makes it special, but then also. You know, where's the appetite for change? I think a lot of folks um, really, you know, when a new leader comes in, it's an opportunity and, it, you know, people embrace it. So having that conversation and open dialogue about what's working, what's not working, and, and looking for the opportunities to change and bring them along for, for, for the ride. So, in my intuition is that you, know, you think about a startup and they look at, you know, they look at somebody like, like you with your profile and they say, hey, we need to scale. We, we basically. Mm -hmm. You know, need um, I'll use this phrase: the adult yeah. in the room who under who. Hey, you worked at a big company, Adobe. So bring that to the table. But you're probably obviously in a culture where that's not, you know, in the DNA yet. And so, talk just a little bit more about how you you get people to embrace that because it's not going to be natural no. to people. Yeah. They're not going to go, "Oh, I am so happy you are here." <laughs> to just implement <laughs> process on. and standard, and this is gonna be great, I've been waiting for you to show up. I yeah. have a feeling that's not the case. Actually, so how, you'd be surprised. Some people are like, well, yes, well, it's they happening. May, they may no, be, you're right, they kidding. may be burned <laughs> out, but, but, but I mean, you gotta get everybody you know, yeah. kind of into the boat. So, so how do you kind of chip through yeah. the existing culture to get them to understand you know, the value proposition? Yeah, and, and you know, and I'll, I'll be honest, like, I think you know, there's, there's great leaders in the team already. I think you know, when, Certainly in my situation for what I'm doing currently, it's really all about how do you bring the different, I'm not gonna call them silos, but the different departments together, right? Mm -hmm. So I think everyone has grown really quickly within their departments. Um, so I think a lot of the focus is really how do you bring those teams together to understand how to show up as a one, the same okay, company yeah. to the customer. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of the focus I do there before even going to the rigor of, of you know, getting into the weeds of any individual organization yeah. is I start at the how do we come together with a customer at the center. So that's kind of like you know my passion project. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that, that usually starts with, you know, again, you take people along for the ride. You know, you have a you have a multi-day session, and you get all the leaders in, in sync. And you know, I don't know if you've read uh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I'm you know asking people to read it again. But you know, there's something about that book that says, hey, you you know, you, your individual goals are not enough. Like your goals as a leader for any one department have to be the goals of the entire team and the yeah. entire company. And so I think. And, you know, making sure that the teams understand what each other do, how does that foster and further the, 
customer you know, yeah. experience is really a, a great area of where we, um, we re-engage first. So let me play this back because I think yeah. this is a really uh, good success tactic, is y coming into that environment, the organizing principle is the customer. Yep. You start there and you say, okay, let's just start with how are we all working together with the customer? Oh, what yep. are you doing over there? And you know, yep. consulting, what, uh, what does CS do? How, how sales? Let's look at how that's working first probably identifying where some of the friction points are. Okay, now that we all you know, understand the opportunities here, then click into, okay, I think now this is what we could probably be doing in a more scalable way yep. in CS or, or other areas, which I think is great. And, and you know, so, ma so many companies say, hey, we are customer centric, mm -hmm. right? But I, you know, and then one click into that, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Oh, we just care so much about the customer. Okay, well, let's click into that. Yeah. What are you doing that makes you, and what you just described there, that is customer-centric. You're saying, well, what are we doing? We're starting with understanding, you know, the, yeah. getting all that lined up, and the North Star is the customer experience. Now let's work, work backwards, well, and people it, can get behind that. Exactly, and it, it really helps with prioritization as well, because otherwise, you know, you look at this map of, like, you know, fast-growing startup, coming in from a legacy company, like you've seen it done at scale, and you're like, there's so many things we could be doing. How do you focus the team on the first steps? And yeah. to me, it really is, what are the top five to seven challenges the customers are experiencing with us? Like, let's start with those, yeah. and we can work backwards, and then we can still certainly fit all the other different priorities on a roadmap as well, but I think yeah. that's, it's just a good way to prioritize yeah. um, where you start. Yeah, definitely, awesome. So let's flip the scenario, because I am sure there are people in this room maybe are working at a smaller company, they've been building customer success, they're, you know, they have a great you know, I'm VP of customer success, and now you have a larger company who says, oh, you know, you know what I need? I need customer success, right? And so, oh, you understand customer success, you're from a SaaS company, that's awesome, come on over. That's a different scenario. So what, you know, what advice would you give them coming from a smaller environment and now you're into this big you know, yeah. environment? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, understand the matrix. There's usually a matrix involved, yeah, yeah, exactly. right? So um, a lot definitely more complexity understand the matrix. going on in terms of yeah. Yeah, uh, there's, there's there is usually a method to the madness, but like understanding like the working organism is a really important part of it. Um, I think there's there's um, there's elements of like history and, and tech dead to understand a little bit as well, right? So it's like because there's usually multiple products, multiple different departments, it's really taking the time to I think understand where each one is. Mm -hmm. Very rarely at large companies have I seen all the products being produced exactly in the same way right. and you know, yeah. magically having the same levels of understanding. So yeah. it's like, it's just getting order, like some sort of consolidated order and map of, of what you're dealing how with. Things is, are actually working. Of how, how things are actually working, I think would be uh, my first piece of advice. Um, I think, you know, certainly in a large company as well, you really do need to develop those relationships across your, you know, peer leaders and your leadership team and kind of almost create your, your own steering yeah. committee, I would say, of peer leaders, um, yeah. because I think they'll be very important in ensuring that they are cascading and, and working with their teams to support mm -hmm. your efforts as well. So yeah. um, I would just start, certainly start there from a getting to know the scenario. And then honestly, with the larger companies, I would also just prioritize going and talking to as many customers as possible, Yeah. quite frankly, Yeah. right? Because I think at some point, you know, you it is, Especially in larger companies, it's 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 their 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 uh, experiences differ vastly, and it's amazing what kind of information you can really get just from getting out there in the field. So yeah, yeah, good, very good advice. Okay, now um, I want to talk about telemetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so so you know we've talked to the fact that you know the, it's if products are generating a telemetry, yeah. there, there's a lot of opportunity there. But you know, let's click into it and. You know, what telemetry, first of all, do you think is most insightful? I mean, what have you found to be the yeah. most impactful for CS? So, I mean, clearly adoption usage type of data, mm -hmm. you know, as an as a overall bucket. But I would say this, um, and this is, I think, helpful when you go talk to product leaders as well. It's um, being intentional about what you want to do with whatever telemetry you collect. So I'd say before you even talk about telemetry, what data you need, it's having a real clear understanding of what you're going to do with it. How are you going to use it? Mm -hmm. What is it going to feed into? Um, and then prioritizing it for, for that as well, right? So, and it might be different in different you know, use cases, right? Yeah. But um, for us, consumption is, that's how we sell, that's how we monetize. It's very important for us um, to understand whether customers are on track and you know, let's say actually using our tooling um, as much as they should be 
it's not even actually that customer friendly though, right? If that's still an internal metric for right, us. So right. it's like for me, it's also um, how do we see if customers are getting value out of the tools, you know, in a certain time frame. So I'm big into usage, consumption, um, but also in measuring the time it takes customers to adopt certain things within tools, because I think that is a really important like piece of the puzzle. Like specific features, like they're using this piece of, feature? Yeah, or how quickly they're consuming. So like, um, you know, the idea of expected consumption curves or expected behaviors. Okay. Um, so when we, I don't, I don't want just t like, um, I want to be able to build baselines with uh, whatever telemetry I create. Mm -hmm. So, and with those baselines, I can say, I expect a customer to be at a certain place three months into their experience with us. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then I can actually say that it's at risk or not versus yeah. like it's collecting the data on its own isn't enough. It's really, it's, it's really curve, thinking through yeah. that entire methodology yeah. and then figuring out which ones are the, the most important ones for you to activate. And especially if you're going to a big company that maybe doesn't have all of this, it will be, it will be a discussion. And even mm -hmm. at a smaller company, it'll be a discussion. They'll say, we can't do it all right now. Yeah. So how do you prioritize which telemetry you want is really based on what will you be able, what value will you be able to get out of it? Is it a health score? Is it, yeah. you know, driving behavior on the customer side on our side. And, and did you say your consumption-based pricing yeah. model? Mm -hmm. oh, and, and what's the unit of consumption, the mechanism there? What, what, it's throughput. Throughput, mm -hmm. okay. So, the, um, so talk a little bit about, you know, CS in that world. Mm -hmm. Because this is a question that we get a lot because, you know, a lot of folks are saying, hey, you know, we're looking at now moving to a consumption usage model. Uh, there are more SaaS companies that have been around for a while that are now actually that they were you know, more mm -hmm. you know, user price based pricing. Now they're moving to consumption. What do you think that does to CS in terms of when that happens? What, what's your observation? You know, interestingly, I I think at least in my world in the in the, in the customer success teams that I've I've, I've run, um, a lot of times the CS teams are driving quote unquote adoption, and this is I think a different flavor of adoption. Mm -hmm. the, the difference of the different element of consumption is that you are looking for additional, um, you know, there's a little bit of like a business development kind of component to it, right? Because you're looking for new additional teams to potentially use the solutions the you have as well, yeah. in addition to driving, con, you know, getting the things that people are using right now healthy. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of the big distinction is that you really could be looking for other usage within the organization, which means you want, you know, you want to be introduced to people and you're, you're doing yeah, more yeah. of a de business development function at yeah. times. Yeah. So the, the big question that gets on the table quickly mm -hmm. around, you know, we, we move to this consumption based model. So we're going to live or die by consumption. Right. And so when it comes to our CS motion, by the way, actually not just CS, I hear this conversation around professional services as well. Yeah. Hey, we're going to a consumption based model. What's the role of PS? The, this thought that gets on the table is why don't we just kind of throw these service motions in because we're going to make it up on the back end because if, if I apply a CS person for free, if I apply some consulting you know, mm -hmm. for free, I have a digital advisor, I throw them in for free, we'll make it up on the back end. Mm -hmm. So th th thoughts I, on that discussion point or that, that philosophy? So I'm not a huge believer of just like dumping everything in for free. First of all, I don't think customers appreciate it. And, and you know, th there's this weird element of like making sure that if you are providing value to a customer, like you have some sort of, you know, something in return that says, hey, if we do this, you, you will do this. So it should unlock something, I would say, rather than just assuming. Um, I do, you know, AWS, Mongo, like lots of companies, for instance, have, you know, a margin neutral PS function. And mm -hmm. part of it is they did discover that if they would, if they could invest more in their customers, and it was usually in very specific cases, right? It wasn't yeah. just like just doing the implementation for free, but it would be to unblock certain things, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that would maybe limit a use case going live or, um, you know, going in there and doing like a two day workshop to help people plan out do a strategy session for the next, you know, what could we do with this solution right. for, over the next, you know, yeah. four months. So like investing in those very smart ways, yeah. I think can be really useful. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that, you know, I think, you know, if you, if you get to the point of like actually, you know, implementation or anything like that, I think that's, that's, that should be paid for. And, yeah. you know, lots of partners out there doing that type of work as yeah. well. So, so, um, and I, you, this is, we're, we're you free will in here. This is a question that I had no idea what your answer was going to be. So I was yeah. just curious what your personal yeah. philosophy was. So let me put a couple things yeah. on the table on this for, for, in terms of just creating bumpers on this conversation for the audience. And again, I think this is relevant to every service capability you have, education, anything that you're thinking about, hey, we're now in consumption usage based. 
if this is going to drive consumption, let's just put it on the table, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that they're, you know, one bumper, and, um, you know, this is uh, born from a conversation I had with Jody Paxton, who used to be a researcher here, and she now is in charge of uh, the service portfolio for Google Cloud. And I had this conversation with her in a podcast episode. And she said, that, you know, the way that we think about a consumption-based model is if the service motion is designed to, is really in our best interest, mm -hmm. like you just said, a strategy session yep. that's going to line up future, that's something we'll, we will absolutely put on the table for free. If it's a service motion that the customer says, that's business value for me, then we should be monetizing yeah. that, which is what you just articulated. We should not be just throwing that in. So I think the first bumper, right, to consider out there is, you know, as you're looking at these service motions, that service monetization threshold is, and we have a paper on this, you can look at it, is a good way to think about it. Answer that question so that you have some discipline there. Yeah. Um, the second thing I will put on the table on this whole topic of let's just throw it in and we'll make it up on the back end, um, and I'm getting old, man. We, we, we did analysis on this uh, oh, over a decade ago, over a decade ago uh, with two companies, EMC and Akamai. Mm -hmm. and, and the analysis is called economic impact analysis. And the working theories in both of these companies is they both had consulting organizations. And they were saying, look, you know, why are we charging for consulting? Because every, you know, if consulting just accelerates, like your EMC, mm -hmm. throw some consulting in, they just buy tons of iron on the back end. That's really what we want. We don't really care about these consulting dollars. So they said, we should do some analysis here. And both companies went in and they analyzed when professional services gets involved or consulting at a certain threshold, does the account grow faster? Do we get bigger deals, yes or no? And guess what? The answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. Big surprise, right? You all know that if your service organizations are involved with your customers, you know, typically good things happen. They're better all customers. Time. They buy more. So really strong correlation here, right? And they have this day and they go, awesome. You know, then why are we charging for this stuff? It's just, in, you know, and again, this is um, a theory of econ economic impact analysis is I do this one thing and it creates, you know, much better. So, um, so they both kind of le leaned into this, and there was other PS organizations, you know, a decade ago thinking about this. Um, but I have never seen a company be able to run that play in the long term, because as soon as you have your first tight quarter, first hiccup on growth, the CEO, the CFO looks around, and the first thing that has got to go is non-revenue generating mm -hmm. resource. So if they turn and say, oh, we've got this PS organization we've been growing, but what, how much revenue do they have? Zero? You know, yeah. we can't afford that. And so I think it, it, the executives just don't have a stomach for it. It sounds really good on paper, but they cannot sustain it. Yeah. And that may, you know, that's why I think it's, it's, it's a high-risk strategy. But, and there's also a psycholo psychological component. So when I was at Adobe, we had a ring-fenced services team. And it was, to, it was an investment team. But in order to get that team to engage, we asked a ton from, we had to have a VP or above sponsor on the right. customer side. Right. Like I said, it was, a, it was still an SOW. Like right. it just, it was still very rigorously run too. Right. And part of it is that the customers have to be able to appreciate that what you're also doing is important. Otherwise they start doing things like not showing up or not taking it seriously exactly, or not putting right. in their own resources, at which right. point, you know, you're out, right? So I do think that's another part of it, which you need no. the customer to take it seriously. You need, well, well, and so let's, I mean, sometimes in this industry, we just keep relearning the same lessons, okay? Mm -hmm. So I cut my teeth in professional services, you know, 20 years ago. And, you know, initially a lot of embedded PS organizations were given away for free. Right, it was an extension of you know a sales capability. Yeah, that's the way we treated it. And what do you find? It's a lot of cost. And what you just put on the table, salespeople you know call up and they go, oh man, I got this really strategic deal, and I need to get some consulting, free consulting in here. Right? Trust me, it's going to be so yeah big on the back end. And we used to just okay, great, fly those consultants out, etc. But then, no, no big deal. So what do we do? We start saying, we gotta put bumpers around this. We're gonna charge for this. The customer's gotta be serious. They gotta have the right level. They gotta have some budget. They're, they have to be leaning in. And so that's how we created more discipline. Mm -hmm. You monetize it, and you, it's a forcing function. Yeah. And, and so here, I think, in some ways, we're relearning this lesson <laughs> around right. you know, CS and, and other right. things, which I think is hilarious. Okay, I got one more question okay. for you. One more. And this is still around 
uh, telemetry, and, and by the way, I just wanted to put back on that telemetry, two important things that you said, two classes. I need telemetry that I can really understand consumption, it's in your self-interest as the provider, and if you're a consumption-based pricing model, that's probably the priority. Mm -hmm. And then when you get your arms around that, there is a set of telemetry which is really helping the customer understand where they are in adoption, and that's my second order, but then I can have a higher value add conversation with them to help them understand, hey, if you want to have success, and here's, here's you know, what we're seeing. Is that, mm -hmm. did I yep. get that accurately? Okay. So, so how do you get, influence the product teams to get you the telemetry that you, that you need? You compensate them on the same things. <laughs> Say that again, compensate them. You compensate them on the same things you put into their comp model. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I'm yeah. half joking only yeah. actually. No, I, no, I think um, that's, I, I like where you're going, keep going. <laughs> No, actually, we did at Adobe. We, uh, I think our, our product teams um, did have an element of adoption that was in their, um, in their comp model, and that actually really was a meaningful shift for their willingness to start putting things like telemetry on the roadmap. And yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say it. And it, again, n not a single one of them is a, is a bad person. They're wonderful people, but it's like the, you know, every product team is fighting different challenges with from customer you know, their typical roadmap, customer asks on fixing things as well as, you know, the CS team that like, kind of wants some adoption data, maybe, right? And so it, it really has to be an aligned, I would say, be it compensation or something else, it has to be an aligned, um, you know, purpose again, right? So mm -hmm. you have to be swimming in the same direction and how the product teams are seen uh, to succeed has to be the same as what you're wanting to get from them. Otherwise, yeah. it's really never going to work unless every once in a while you'll get a bluebird and a product team will be, you know, very into this stuff and will just do it because they know it's important. But otherwise, I do think it needs to be more structural. Well, I mean, there's an old saying in the industry, right? If you want to understand what a company cares about, just look at people's comp plans. And so, I mean, it's a very simple but powerful thought. Hey, the product teams care about consumption, yes or no, we'll look at their comp plan. And if they, yeah. they have zero incentive on it, then, then they're not as serious. So I, I like that answer. Short, sweet, to the <laughs> point. Okay, well, we, we used up our time here. Mario, I really okay. appreciate the conversation. I really enjoy it. Thank Please, you. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was fun.